Good morning. Talk title is a study of automating eye mask creation. I thought about a couple of different titles for this. This one's okay. We will be talking about eye masks, but the important thing is really the study of automating. And in particular, I want to talk about blender wizards and creating wizards inside a blender. I'm Dr. John Denning here speaking on behalf of Orange Turbine. So the target audience here uh, for, for this talk is going to be a little bit toward artists, a little bit toward add-on developers, and a little bit toward Blender developers. So I'm hoping that each of you uh, will be able to pick up at least just a little bit uh, from this talk here. So the case study for today is a company called Elio Labs. They're a health and beauty startup. Uh, they sought out to try to prevent uh, eye bags and puffy eyes. And the way they did this was to create a custom fitted 3D printed eye mask. Uh, the function of this is similar to like compression socks. It's supposed to apply some pressure, uh, light pressure in certain areas to prevent fluid from building up. Uh, it consists of a soft flexible liner for comfort and then a rigid nylon frame for structure and then elastic strap to hold it on place. And they had a process already in place to be able to produce these, um, but they wanted to automate a lot of that process. So that is where they contacted us to try to see what we can do. From the client's perspective, they download an app, they scan their face following the directions, uh, it creates a 3D model of their face, and that model gets shipped to Elio, where a designer will take that information uh, of, the, of the head and do some processing to it to come up with two different meshes that get sent to the printers, and then those items get shipped to the customer. So here is one right here. The original design document, though, consists of 28 different steps. Everything from importing the STL to positioning it at a certain uh, location, potentially scaling it. Uh, and then it was importing in other templates, projecting it to the face, uh, going into edit mode, moving some vertices around, deleting some, uh, joining some meshes. It was, it was very involved. Uh, it took a skilled artist or designer uh, about 90 minutes to create one mask. But all of those steps kind of broke down into kind of two categories. We have some design-related steps. Uh, these are things that are really specific to the actual design of the mask itself, uh, identifying and working relative uh, to relatively to uh, landmarks on the head. So like, where are the eyes? Where's the bridge of the nose? Where are the temples? And so on. And then they were making adjustments based on certain design constraints. They needed a certain width uh, for the material to be printable and rigid enough, uh, these type of things. So these are very specific to the mask itself. But then there were a lot of steps that were involved with just dealing with Blender. Uh, managing the modes, uh, going in and out of edit mode, um, adjusting settings, fiddling with the UI, selecting things, changing the viewport, uh, adjusting modifiers to have a sufficient geometry count, and that sufficient could kind of change on where it was in the, in the process, uh, modifying the mesh to regularize it or reorient orient, uh, polygons, um, but also to know they had to know a little bit about how modifiers work so that as they're adjusting the settings, they can know how to, uh, or how to optimize the setting to, to where they're headed. So there were some things that were very specific to the eye mask, but then there was a lot of things that they were also having to do. They were spending a lot of time on doing. And this bottom part is where a lot of the training actually had to come in. But we looked at that and we saw that their process actually had good properties of making it into a wizard, uh, an automated, semi-automated process. Uh, the, the steps were broken down uh, very clearly, um, and they were very succinct, so it was like, do this in this step, do this in this step. Uh, the adjustments that they had to make 
were very well defined and they were very precise. So uh, the the thickness of the the frame had to be a, a certain number of millimeters. Um, the human basically adjusted the uh, a few parameters and worked with proxies. So especially around the side of the head, there may be hair um, involved, and they didn't want to project to the hair, uh, so they would. Uh, put in a curved surface um, um, as, as a proxy. And then uh, towards the front, it would fit very well. It would project very closely to the face. But then along the sides, it would uh, smooth out to the, to the proxy. And so basically, they were working to guide the system uh, along. And the, the really the only kind of tricky part was just managing the software state. So. In other words, let the humans do what they're good at, identifying landmarks, optimizing intuitive parameters, making artistic decisions where it's necessary, and then let the computers do what they're good at, which is computation and managing data and states, and let the human basically guide that automation. Uh, and that's kind of the key thing to making uh, a process into a semi-automated or even fully automated uh, wizard. So that's what we did. We took those ideas, those steps, and up here, there's a, uh, about the 28. So we're down to about 24 steps. But the important thing is the quads up there are all involving human interaction. So we have um, uh, selecting the STL file, um, identifying the customer by their ide uh, identification number, uh, landmarking uh, different places of the head. So it's very, very simple, very clear cut. The user is involved. The hexagons, though, those are the fully automated steps along the way. So adding in modifiers, setting their parameters, applying those modifiers, um, selecting faces and deleting and joining and, and bridging, all that good stuff. So most of the stuff up there is a very simple user interaction. Uh, and the rest of it is uh, fully automated things. Now, we do have some diamond-shaped quads up there. Those are mostly just confirmation steps. So it was along the process, we wanted to, well, sometimes we had to, but uh, we wanted to make sure that the automated system did the right things and made the right decisions along the way. Um, and when needed, we might expose a couple of parameters that, uh, or um, a set of settings that they can select from. So if it happened to not work out well, they can click a button uh, and change the parameters and rerun the step. But the other cool thing about this is at any point along the way, they can transition from one state to the next or go back. So if they needed to make some adjustments, they can always move back all the way back to the, to the very beginning. So it allowed them the flexibility to be able to kind of um, make adjustments, uh, see the effects of it, and then go back. The other cool thing is the user in interaction part, so all of the little quads that are up there, um, they're very basic. Uh, the amount of training is very minimal um, to, um, to get a person, a designer, up and going. And that 90 minutes that it took a skilled designer before now takes less than five minutes for just a very lightly trained um, individual. So here's a couple of screenshots of the tool. Uh, here, the head is being uh, landmarked, and the user, uh, the designer, all they need to do is click on uh, different places. So one of the ears, the eyes, the tip of the nose, the other eye, and the other ear. And in fact, the wizard will even, as you're clicking, it'll change the view to be the side or the front or the other side, uh, depending on what it's looking for. And then the user can um, move those points around if they happen to. Uh, not hit it very precisely. So you still had the control of being able to move the camera, um, but it's just helping them along the way. In this shot here, they're uh, adjusting the proxy that is approximating the head. This is especially around the hair, um, so it can, uh, the projection can ignore um, any of the geometry about the hair. Um, but in particular, this proxy is supposed to be very close approximation of the head. So there's going to be a lot of, it, of intersections and overlapping. Uh, and so we need to have both of them being transparent so you can see both inside and out. However, sometimes you might need to check that off. And so this step here sets up all of the, uh, the 
materials uh, to be transparent, but still exposing a couple of parameters up there, little checkboxes for the artist, uh, the designer to, to change as needed. And then in this screenshot here, we have uh, a very complicated set of um, interacting pieces. So the, the frame itself is con it consists of two different layers. There's a few, few reasons for this. Um, but there's a lot of vertices involved in there. Um, in the previous process, they were turning on proportional editing and moving those vertices around and then guessing at um, how well it's going to project. Whereas here, we've marked a few of the vertices using uh, vertex groups um, as being control points with a fall off automatically defined. So all the user needs to do is they don't even have to think about edit mode. They just go in, click on a vertex or one of the control points and move it, and everything kind of moves along with it. But it, it moves it across multiple objects, not just the one that you're currently working on. Uh, so when it goes in to cut holes for uh, the liner to poke through so that the two pieces can, uh, can stay together, those holes as well as the little stubs that go through those holes are also affected by those control points. So everything moves uh, very well together. And here's uh, one of the shots of the confirmations. Uh, it is uh, after the liner has gone through its processing uh, stage uh, where uh, the, the front of it is projected to the face and then the sides, which don't project very well, um, were deleted off, and then a template edge is added. The meshes are joined uh, and bridged. Um, but sometimes it can have um, a, a few issues. It didn't quite cut enough of the stuff, so we expose a couple of parameters. But for the most part, the user really doesn't need to adjust it. It's mostly just a confirmation. Everything looks good. Go on to the next step. So, a few challenges that we ran into, every head is different. <laughs> uh, they had a really nice process that worked fairly well for a um, average head, but they started getting more and more uh, different shapes of heads. Uh, you know, the distances between eyes are different, uh, the profile of the nose and the, and the, and the brow, um, the location of uh, the cheekbones uh, is very, very different, and it ended up breaking a lot of their, um, a lot of their workflow. Um, and so we needed some ways to sort of replicate the issues that they were having. Uh, we were working across the world, people in China and, and uh, Western uh, US. Uh, so we needed some ways to be able to have them submit their, um, their issues that they ran into. And the way that we did this was to basically instrument everything. So every action that the designer makes, every decision that they make, is being recorded somewhere, along with um, having uh, a copy of the mesh um, through, through each of the steps. But the cool thing about that is we can load that into our um, into the wizard as a little button, and we can basically speed run to the point that they were running into. Because some of the process takes a little bit, you have to click through some stuff, and we wanted to see exactly what it was that the designer was running into so we can know how to fix it. But also, because it, different heads broke the process, Elio needed to iterate over lots and lots of designs. I don't know exactly what design number they're on right now. This one, I think, is close to like design five or six. But that meant that our tool needed to be flexible enough to uh, be able to iterate as well. Uh, they also tried out some different printers, different materials, working through uh, material issues, um, and like I said, working through design, excuse me, design weaknesses. Um, but the wizard actually helped them do that job. Uh, that because we reduced that runtime from 90 down to about five minutes, basically just kind of clicking through, and also with the instrumentation, uh, they were able to very quickly iterate over new, uh, new designs. The other thing I forgot to mention is the way that we implemented this, getting a little bit on the nerdy side, is we implemented as a finite state machine, which allowed us to um, basically treat it as different states um, as, we're, as we're moving along. Um, but because we modeled it in that particular way as a finite state machine, 
it allowed us to be able to reorder, uh, create new steps, um, delete steps very easily. Um, so uh, again, um, kind of going toward the, the iteration, um, helping with the iteration. Another challenge we ran into is the quality settings that you have for inspecting and making sure everything looks good and uh, evaluation are not interactive. Uh, the subdivision levels were way high. We're doing lots of projection on high geometry. Um, so it was not feasible to grab a, a control point and move it around uh, interactively. So the, um, the way we worked around this was to, uh, when the control point was clicked, to reduce all of the levels of the things that are less important for adjustments, uh, so it's still a good approximation to what the end, uh, the end result will look like, but it runs at a much more interactive rate. Another challenge we met, we have lots and lots of assets. We have many different versions. Uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, different things that need to be shown uh, to the designer, um, maybe not all the time, just some of the time. So we created a library file. It's just a blend file with a, with a whole bunch of things in it that uh, contain everything that is needed uh, for, the, um, for the designer to do their work. Uh, but also in that it has all the meshes that they were working with marked up in some particular way. We use vertex groups a lot uh, to identify what, what are going to be control points, what parts of the meshes are going to be bridged together, uh, what is the upper half and the lower half, um, what's going to be the front side, so that that gets a texture applied to it versus the back side. Um, so it just allowed us to very quickly, again, be able, uh, be able to iterate very quickly. But also we ha uh, hand wrote a bunch of scripts, a little hard to read here, but uh, they prepared the objects for uh, being used in the library because sometimes the objects may be, um, have a wrong origin, uh, so we need to be able to apply uh, and adjust uh, the origin or remove modifiers or print out all the settings of the modifiers as well. Another thing, um, when we got the new design from Elio, uh, it would have all of the modifiers uh, on it, um, not applied quite yet, so that we could be able to replicate what was going on. But when you import in objects with modifiers, it tends to pull in everything else those modifiers are touching. Um, and uh, it was a lot easier to um, just strip away all those modifiers and then re-add them in in code. Uh, so we kept around the originals that had the modifiers still in there, um, but the, the version that gets imported in has uh, very, very few of the modifiers. Maybe applying the mirror modifier, but that would be about it. Another challenge we ran into is undoing, because we needed to be able to go forward, but also backward. Um, and undo in uh, Blender works pretty well, unless you're doing something weird like what we do. Um, so it was hard to know when an undo would get pushed on. It was also very hard to control that, uh, whether to force an undo to happen or prevent an undo from happening. Um, but also, undo only captures some of the data changes. It doesn't capture everything. This is a really hard problem. Uh, it's, again, we're doing something very weird. So the way we worked around it was we just wrote our own undo system, which basically involved making a copy of every instance uh, of the change, and we stashed it away in a hidden scene. So over, over here you can see all the different backups that are in there. But along with that, we have all the uh, instrumentation details. Some challenges that we also ran into that are not quite yet met, well, uh, the dependency graph. Uh, it reevaluates very often, um, perhaps more often than, than what it is. If we're applying a bunch of operators, uh, excuse me, applying a bunch of modifiers to, to an object, um, it reevaluates after every application. There was no way to say, all right, hold up, we're going to do a few more operations. We don't really need to know what the current state is quite yet, but uh, let's just apply it through. Um, so what we, uh, what we ended up doing was we disabled the modifiers while we're applying uh, so that they just would not be uh, reapplied every time. Um, but it was, not, it was not a great solution. So this is a really hard problem. 
Um, I'm not entirely sure how to solve this, um, but um, it was something that we ran into. The other thing we ran into, which is a kind of another weird thing, is the modal operator stack, kind of a stack, um, was not really accessible. It was hard to tell uh, who or what modal operator had control. So if we're uh, our Wizard ran as a modal operator, but anytime we wanted to grab the model and move it around, that was another modal operator, and it was hard to figure out uh, when that gave us back control. And uh, also, the visualization changes uh, with that, so it may show the gizmo um, at times. Um, what we ended up doing was just ignoring as much as possible, meaning like it is what it is, um, or we ended up writing uh, custom versions when we needed, needed to. Another challenge that we ran into, Boolean modifiers can be really finicky, especially when you try to automate them. Uh, in particular, on the inside of the, the frame, we have a customer identification that gets applied there. So these are just digits that are unioned onto, onto the frame. But sometimes, if the, those digits didn't get positioned correctly, then the union didn't work, and geometry just kind of disappears. And there's no way to tell that that operator actually failed according to how um, how we're um, interested. So a lot of those confirmation steps that we had in there, some of them did have some um, options to, to be able to, to tweak, but mostly they were also in there to make sure that everything worked fine, that the operators didn't mess up. All the digits that are supposed to be there are actually there. Also, the UI system is a little bit cumbersome, uh, a little bit too cumbersome to work uh, in a quick prototyping session. So quickly iterating over different designs, adding a new button, uh, just takes a while. Uh, it takes a lot of code, um, and um, it's, just, it's just very cumbersome. So what we ended up doing was basically writing our own uh, system, UI system, that converts Markdown, HTML, a little bit of CSS, and Python um, and turns it into UI widgets uh, that show up. So it allows us to very quickly iterate. We can control very well uh, how the overall UI looks. OK. Here's basically my last slide. I had mentioned that the, this talk was geared toward artists, add-on developers, as well as Blender developers. Here's your takeaways. Artists. A lot of the work that you are doing could potentially be automated or semi-automated. Um, if you are able to define very well what those uh, adjustments and operations need to be, and they're very clear, like what is uh, the value for, for those things, um, talk with the developer. Maybe, maybe we can automate it. Maybe it's not going to be a one-button push uh, to, to solve it, but it can get you, get you there pretty quickly. Um, and especially if you can limit the amount of information that you need to provide uh, and let the computer do its job. Add-on developers, uh, try to design for iteration. It's going to be part of it, even if the customer comes to you and says, this is the final version. It's never the final version. Um, so try to build that into your system. Also design for replay, because a lot of times the customer is going to run into problems that you need to recreate and see how you can be able to fix it. So instrument and replay is, is key. And then Blender developers, thank you for Blender applications that's coming. I'm very excited to see what we can do with that. Um, I think already Blender is very capable of doing some really cool stuff like what we've done. Um, it's very weird to traditional Blender stuff, but, uh, but it can be done. There are still a few challenges I'd mentioned. There are a few more. Um, happy to talk with you about that, but uh, great work. And thank you.